Hello. Helldivers 2 has been out for a little while now. It's a fun game, and new players are soon joining up every day. It's also not the easiest game. After you've played for a bit, there's a good chance that at some point you will begin to struggle. If you're like me, you'll slowly be making your way through the difficulties until you reach a wall that seems impossible to beat. Now, in any other genre, you'd either level up your character more, or get better gear and then try again. And so you unlock more weapons and stratagems, and you keep trying, but you're still being roadblocked for one reason or another. Maybe the robots are too scary, or maybe Helldive is too daunting. Well, I've been in that exact position before, and I'm here to help. With personal experience and asking other higher level players for their own advice and helpful tips, I was eventually able to go from embarrassing myself to almost breezing through Helldives consistently. I'd say I know a decent bit about the game, and today I'd like to put that knowledge out into the public ether. Now, don't get me wrong, this video isn't meant as just a Helldive guide. The footage I gathered will be from the top 3 highest difficulties in the game currently, but you can apply everything I say to any difficulty, no matter what. I'll be talking about loadouts, as you'd expect, but more importantly focus on helping you out with adjusting your mindset and tactics while playing the game. Originally, I was also going to include a section about primary weapons, but in hindsight that would just make this video age extremely quickly. My reasoning being that there's a new balance patch almost every week that changes things up. What's considered the peak of meta might be nerfed in the next update. So, I'm not gonna worry about trying to make a timeless weapons tier list, and instead, let's focus on some slightly more important things. Like, how should your team's strategy and composition look like? What should you always bring to a mission? How should you act around patrols? How do you deal with the million heavy enemies that tend to show up? All that being said, Held Hours is a co-op game and a large part of your success will hinge on the behavior of your squad mates. Still, your own contribution is important and there is the possibility that you alone will clutch the mission. So let me try and help you out. And even if you've been playing for a while, there is still a chance that you might learn something new. If you're an experienced player yourself and think that at any point I've missed something, or said something wrong, or even just want to emphasize something, feel free to leave a comment. I'll do my best to cover everything, but there's always a chance I'll mess up. If that sounds acceptable, I'll go ahead and start with the very first step. The pregame. If you happen to be the host selecting an operation to play on, or even joining someone in a lobby, it's a good idea to pay attention to the mission modifiers. What these look like now and what they will look like in the future could be drastically different. New planetary exclusive modifiers are being added while others are being tweaked or outright removed. Uh, newer players don't get to experience the joys of a stratagem scramble, for example. So there's not much point in talking about each and every single unique modifier in detail since they might just disappear. Instead, I'll look at the general picture and point out some of the more important parts. In the current patch, relevant to this video, the cooldown modifiers have received some rather steep changes, going from a 100% extra cooldown to a measly 25%. Modifiers are also now decided by the whole planet instead of individual operations. You can have a maximum of 2 or the minimum of 0 and the difficulty doesn't matter anymore. So if you have a nice planet to fight on, it's going to be a smooth ride whether you play on Trivial or Helldive. That being said, there are some unique modifiers for the two factions that we have right now. Terminated maps have a chance to feature bug spores. The map spores basically don't do anything. You can still see where the objectives are and the heat from the bug hive still shows up in the prep phase. Automaton machines are more annoying since they have the AA modifier. This causes you to have one less stratagem available and that can hurt a lot. Even when you have all four slots available, you still might have a small hole in your loadout. It's difficult to flawlessly prepare for absolutely everything. Cutting off an entire quarter of your total ability will hurt no matter what. In the future, I expect there will be quite a lot of different modifiers, maybe even special operations or mission types that affect your stratagems even further. The main point is that you should always weigh your options. Don't throw yourself headfirst into the first operation you see and decide what will hurt you the least. Whether it's the slower call-ins for precision orbital strikes, longer cooldowns for already slow stratagems or other factors. So we have our mission selected, let's talk about stratagems. There's quite a lot of overlap of what's viable between both factions, but some things perform better than others. First off, you should work with the assumption that you're going to be fighting as a team. You can go solo if you want, and sometimes it is more efficient to quickly do a side objective or take out a mini outpost just on your own, but going solo for the whole mission isn't something that I advise, unless you're a 300 hour solo god. It's better to always be in a squad of at least two people at the absolute minimum. That means working in tandem and breaking stratagems that complement each other. Most of the time you don't know who you're gonna be side by side, but you can get a general idea of what to bring from the prep phase. Are your teammates bringing the 500 kilo bomb but nothing for horde fighting? Grab an eagle cluster. Is everyone bringing an auto cannon or some sort of ammo hungry support weapon? Take a supply pack with an LMG or one of the laser weapons. Side note that relates to this, when you're in the actual mission, remember that you can look at what your teammates are using and what their cooldowns are. 
You don't have to check this constantly, but give it an occasional glance. You don't want to start a fight when everyone is on cooldown. Second off is knowing what works best against each faction. The Terminates are a primary squishy light armored melee swarm faction, but have a handful of heavy hitters. The bots have a lot of medium armor and shoot back at you, but pretty much all of their armored units can be dealt with anti-light vehicle weapons, like the autocan or the anti-material rifle. If this sounds confusing to you because you've only heard of light, medium and heavy armor, then don't worry, I'll go a bit into specifics later. The biggest annoyances when fighting against bugs are bow titans, chargers and to some degree bow spewers. So having an equal mix of direct anti-tank and some spread explosive damage is ideal. Against boss, you're going to be up against hordes of medium armored enemies that like to slowly lumber towards you in a firing line. More spread damage is necessary here and while they are the harder fashion of the two, there are tools and tactics that make fighting them less of a pain. So first off, the big guns. The rail cannon and the orbital laser seem deceptively decent, but both have large cooldowns and aren't as effective as some other options. The laser tracks and destroys everything, but you're better off using it as a bot outpost clearer, as it can easily destroy an entire outpost by itself. Panic throwing it into a crowd is also an option, but keep in mind you only get 3 uses for a whole mission. Technically, that's 12 if everyone takes one, but it has a huge cooldown and doesn't last very long. It's not as thoughtless and universal of a tool as it might seem. The rail cannon is powerful and comes out instantly, but there's no guarantee that it will manage to kill a bow titan that isn't already damaged, and with its huge cooldown it feels like it's almost a waste throwing it at a charger or a tank or a hulk, not to mention you're at the mercy of AI auto-targeting. And even if it does kill, there might be more than one heavy to deal with. It's quick and deals an okay amount of damage, but you're gonna be waiting a long time to get another shot. These are the two most popular orbitals I see people use, and while there's an argument for both, you're better off not relying on them too much. If you must take one, take the laser. The Eagle Strikes are generally more useful overall. The upgrade that gives you more Eagle Strikes is something to aim for, and I will be working with the assumption that you have it for the purpose of this guide. If you don't have it yet as a Euro player, that's fine, but I highly recommend beelining towards it. The 500 kilo bomb tends to be the most common anti bow titan weapon, but I've seen people use the Precision Orbital Strike in the same way. The trick is to wait for a bot to stop moving, usually by baiting out an attack and then throwing it at his feet. It's a bit janky, but most of the time he will die from a single bomb, usually. The blast radius is much, much smaller than it looks, and it sometimes gets blocked for mysterious reasons. It really isn't an anti-horde weapon like you might think it should be. It's also good against most structures, automaton or terminate. The Eagle Strafe, the Eagle Cluster Strike, the Orbital Gatling and Orbital Airburst all go into the Chaff Clearing Territory. The strafe is good when you have enemies chasing you in line, the gatling can cover a tight area with some explosive damage, and the airburst will suppress a bug bridge all by itself. Most of the time, however, you'll probably be using the eagle cluster strike since you get 5 runs with the upgrade. Good against both factions, just be careful not to kill your friends. The 110mm rockets are a jack of all trades and end up with a lackluster performance. The rockets sometimes miss, and when they hit, they almost never kill on the first pass. Any target that's even slightly moving will usually dodge them. You might need two or even all three strikes just for one enemy. They're good against bot tanks, but that's where that ends. The regular air strike is far more useful for every situation. It can clear patrols, it can clear bug holes, and it can kill factories. And if you get lucky, it's a pretty good wave clear as well. It will stay with you all the way until the end of the game. Another good outpost slash wave clear is the walking barrage. It has a good spread that's not too wild and destroys both buildings and regular enemies, and unlike the laser, you get infinite uses per mission. Plus, since it moves forward, you can throw it down and then slowly keep moving. Momentum is quite important on Heldaf, you'd never want to be in a hole for no reason. The other barrages aren't all that great. At best, they do some damage but prevent you from moving into an objective. At worst, they do nothing. I've seen enemies walk through a 380 barrage unscathed more than once. Some people use the 120mm barrage to clear out outposts and the like, but the effectiveness of that is questionable. Feel free to experiment but the walking barrage is the one that I recommend the most. Moving on to support weapons, the EATs are very good and I personally take them almost every time against the bugs. Their hilariously fast cooldown and quick use means you can pop chargers and bot titans all day. They don't need a backpack and do the same damage as a recoilless rifle, enough to kill a charger in one shot to the head. If you get good with stretch and sticking, they can also double down as a manual rail cannon strike. Uh, more on that mechanic later. If you prefer the larger ammo pool of the recoilless rifle, then that's alright too. Just get ready to play around the slow reloads. You can team reload of course, but in a frantic battle where you're surrounded and chased by enemies, that's not really gonna happen. Compare that to the EAT which you can pick up, fire, discard and immediately use another one. 
This makes sudden heavy encounters a lot more manageable. They're not quite as good against the automaton since you're better off with a support weapon that can deal with multiple enemies instead, but you can still take them. On top of that, the new Quasar Cannon is available. It's like a recoil rifle, except it does need a backpack. And it has infinite ammo. It needs to charge up before firing, and then it needs to cool down after. But those are acceptable downsides in my opinion. It reels for you, even when you put it away, and you can use something like the personal shield or a rover on top of it. It's also good for both factions. It's so good, in fact, that it kind of made the recoil rifle a bit pointless for me, personally. Sure, the Quasar doesn't have a team reel function, and you cannot reflex kill due to the charge up, so the recoil rifle still does have some advantages. It's a decent balance, I'd say. It's just that it's not significant enough for me to personally go back to the recoilless. The spear is... Uh, the, the, the spear. When it works, it's potentially great. It can, in fact, one-shot heavy enemies, assuming it, the rocket aims for the correct weak point, and it can destroy bot buildings at range. Uh, trust me on that. If Arrowhead ever decides to fix a lock-on, this might be a good weapon. Soon. One day. Let's talk about the light vehicle armor I mentioned before. This armor type is predominantly used by the automatons. Volca front plates, Hulk visors, and the new gunship engines are covered by this armor type. Support weapons like the AMR and the auto cannon can penetrate it, along with anything that's purposely named anti-tank. This is why the AMR and the auto cannon are such popular picks for the automatons. Not only can they take out hulks from the front, they can very easily dispatch devastators as well. The auto cannon can also destroy bug holes and bot fabricators by ricocheting off the vents. The anti material rifle can't do that, but it doesn't require a backpack. However, it does have a slightly misaligned sight. It's a known issue and it's supposedly getting fixed soonish. So, if you're struggling against the hordes of devastators or hulks, grab the appropriate weapon and aim for the heads. Glacier Cannon is also decent since it's been buffed. If you don't mind the heat management, it can be a pretty powerful weapon, especially on cold planets. Just aim for the weak points. Of course, now the Quasar is stepping into the shoulder-mounted laser weapon territory, but I wouldn't say that it completely replaced it since the Beam Cannon is much better at dealing with individual small and medium enemies. The Grenade Launcher, meanwhile, is better at bigger groups and is great at killing your teammates. It can also close spawners, and explosive damage is useful to have, though the green launcher does start to slightly fall off in favor of the previously mentioned weapons at the higher difficulties. And, of course, the arc thrower. You point, and you shoot, and hopefully not kill your teammates in the process. The arc goes through multiple enemies, and can now stun heavy enemies too, though its range has been decreased in the recent patch, so who knows what it will look like in the future. Let's talk about some of your backpack options. The beam rover is still as good as ever against the terminates, it might lick you or your squad once or twice, but its ability to deal with small, annoying targets isn't to be underestimated. You get to save a lot of ammo, and you can direct your attention to bigger threats. It pairs really well with the new Quasar Cannon too. The personal shield also still exists as an option. It's been good since the start, and even after being tweaked and a bit nerfed, it's still alright. It just won't make you invincible. Just remember to offer up a spare shield to your squad when it goes off cooldown again. Being a support gunner with an ammo backpack is good if you like supporting your teammates. The stalwart is a basically better primary that lets you reload on the move, and the medium MG lets you penetrate medium armor, at the cost of slightly worse ammo economy and stationary reloads. The new HMG has even less ammo, but it offers LVA penetration. Sadly, the recoil makes it nearly unusable for that, even with the recoil reducing armor. I don't know, I don't feel like it's very good, even for meme purposes. Still. Clearing small enemies and keeping your AC or recoil users topped off is definitely helpful. Finally, the big boy toy, the Exo Mech. Or the one that we currently have at least. With 14 rocket pods and a minigun with medium AP, it's actually quite good against terminates. Or it used to be until they broke it and made it so that you can't look down anymore. Why? I guess you can play around with it in extermination missions, but man, I hope this is temporary. Of all the things that I want to be updated information in the future, that's probably this. The other stratagems are usually up to personal choice. For me, the shield generator is particularly underrated. The worst thing about fighting bots is all the flinching you suffer when being shot at, and you get shot at a lot. Negate that for a minute so that your team can rip the bots apart, and suddenly the game is much easier. Turrets are powerful, but they get destroyed quickly even if you try to protect them. The exception might be the EMS turret. If you place it correctly, then it can stun entire hordes and make your life so much easier. But again, vulnerable, and it has to compete with other orbital strikes. Uh, throw it behind a cliff or something. The auto cannon turret gets a special mention for being a decent anti armor and medium option, but again, it's exposed when open fire and it will be swarmed and die just as quickly. Uh, don't bring the mines. Please. And a final lesson to close this section off. Pay attention to what your squad is bringing all the time. Is there enough anti-armor in your roster? Will you be able to deal with the swarm, or is everyone bringing the rail cannon and 500 kilo bombs? 
even if you can't communicate for whatever reason, you should always try to harmonize your loadouts just by sight. There are more stratagems available, but these ones should work all the time. Once again, this will help you if you're struggling. No need to always run the best things all the time. If you want to try hard and beat a tough challenge that you can't get over, then this is what it's for. If you want to mess about and have fun, well, there's nothing stopping you from running 4 auto cannons or becoming the laser master. As I stated at the start of the video, there's not much point in trying to make a future-proof weapons tier list. Talking about the recent nerfs and buffs and the like will just date the video and not do much else. Grenades and boosters, however, might be worth looking into. We have a small selection now that will more than likely grow in the future, but I imagine the core philosophy of your picks will stay the same. Do you want damage? Or utility. Impact grenades are what I use the most, as they're great for instantly deleting a small group of enemies or hurting bigger boys. They also work great against the bot heat vents, and you don't even need a direct hit sometimes. And this goes for any bug that has a big glowy bot weak point too. Their biggest weakness is the difficulty in trying to blow out the bot fabricator, which is still possible but hard, and potentially killing yourself. The default grenades are uh, much better in that regard. The stun grenades from the cutting edge warbond, meanwhile, are very powerful in a different way. If you ever find yourself having problems with hulks or chargers, here's your remedy. Pop this down and you can make a quick escape or line up the easiest headshot of your life. Now, the boosters. Obviously more will be added in the future, but we already have a very solid foundation that I don't think will be changing much. Full supplies, more stamina and more health tends to be the most common trio. Some people argue against the full supply booster and if you never die, and if your squad sticks together, and if nobody fights over supply drops in mission, then sure, you might not need it, uh, but you're putting a lot of faith into your team. There's a lot of ifs in that sentence. 9 out of 10 missions in Helldivers will have at least a few deaths happen, and it's extremely convenient to spawn in fully loaded, especially if you're in a hot situation or running the extra grenades or stims armor. I tend to use the booster most of the time, but if you don't, then that's your choice. More stamina and more health is self-explanatory. You don't get any hard numbers from the tooltip, but from what the community has tested, the most common take is that the increase is somewhere between 30 to 50% for both. Definitely worth taking every time. For the fourth booster, it's a toss-up. The Muscle Enhancement Booster lets you mitigate terrain effects, and it helps you with the slowness poison from the bugs, among a few other things. As for the other choices, 4 more reinforcements might not seem that great in the grand scheme of things, but if you're in for a tough time, it could prevent a team wipe near the end of a mission. Bigger radar is okay if you're still thinking about, and I still have no idea if the localization confuser works correctly. Uh, probably. Maybe, who knows. Finally, the armors. Light lets you run away from the skittering menace and ollie away out of a terrible firefight, uh, but you'll fold like a paper bag if you start getting hit. Meanwhile, medium armors tend to be, uh, well, medium. They usually have some interesting perks on offer, and they're the type of armor that I use the most, because I'm gonna justify my pre-order somehow, damn it. Having 6 grenades ups your offensive power by a good amount, and the medic armors give you even more survivability, and a bit of support in case your buddies are in stims. And, of course, if you're a believer in the RNG gods, you can use Democracy Protects, my favorite perk. Put your faith into the dice roll and survive an airstrike run that landed right on top of your head. And finally, heavy armors make you slow, but give you more health. The slowness is pretty dangerous when fighting against the Terminates. They're a quick melee horde faction. Being able to run and shoot at the same time is the better strategy. No amount of armor will let you survive a Ball Titan. But against the Automatons, there might be an argument for using it. Lower recoil can help out with some of the heavier support weapons, specifically the machine guns, and the explosive resist can ease the pain of constant rocket salvos. Assuming you don't get headshotted, because helmets have effectively zero armor rating for whatever reason. Light armor tends to be the most popular type, simply because picking your fights is a good ability to have. Quickly engaging or pulling away can mean a lot, you don't need to fight and die on every hill, and getting around the map quickly is beneficial. On the other hand, tanking that one extra shot or two might in fact mean a difference between life and death. Personally, as I said, I use medium armor the most. Jokes aside, it still manages to offer both reasonable speed and protection at the same time. Sometimes you're also destined to die and no amount of armor min-maxing will help you. There are a few third-party sites that list all the armors in the game, among a few other things. If you're really agonizing over what to pick, you can check those out and find out what will be in the Superstore next. Perks first, fashion second. Let your personal preference guide you. So, you decided on your armor, you know what stratagems are good, and you've picked a mission. Let's get into the most important part of the video then. Choosing a good starting point if you're the host is important. Depending on your pick, you might have a nice clean start, or lose 10 reinforcements within the first 5 minutes. Generally, the closer to a sub-objective you can get, the better. Note I said sub-objective, i.e. part of the main objective. 
Ideally you want to be going in a circle around the map so that you can hit everything without needing to double back, but sometimes that's not possible. A uh, high tier strategy is dropping near the extract and starting from there. You can secure it immediately if there is an enemy presence and call in extra supplies or weapon stratagems in preparation for the last phase of the mission. Before locking in, I like to remind you what I said during the stratagem part of the video. Watch what your teammates are picking and synchronize with them. Diversify and make sure your team is prepared for outpost clearing, hordes and heavy enemies equally. Whether the actual drop itself will be smooth or not is largely up to chance. Even if you land away from a hot zone, you might land right on top of a patrol or an occupied point of interest. The main thing is to keep calm. Kill everything before the enemies have a chance to call in reinforcements if possible. If there are reinforcements inbound and no other patrols or enemies are within range, you should be able to deal with whatever is about to assault you. If you're in a situation where you drop in, a little patrol, and you're also in range of a bot artillery or something equally bothersome, it might be a good idea to run away. This mostly happens on automata missions, but you can also drop right next to a shrieker nest. Get away from whatever static danger is nearby, call down your equipment, and then shoot whatever is following you. However, running away from an immediate danger doesn't mean you should be running across the whole map, triggering every single outpost and patrol. If your team has an optimal loadout, like it should, one single enemy reinforcement wave shouldn't cause you to lose the mission right off the bat. In fact, it might actually be a better idea to run towards the static danger, wipe whatever immediate threat is around, call down your equipment, and rush down that artillery post or shuriken nest. Destroy everything as speedily as you can, and then hold out against whatever is left. This way you get to make progress and secure the area around you at the same time. As I mentioned, landing on top of an extract so that you can set up for supplies later is a good idea. You don't necessarily have to land there either, you can set up the extraction point midway through the mission if you happen to come across it. And should you have any samples on you, it's a good idea to leave them on the landing pad. They won't disappear. And it's much preferable over dying with the samples in the middle of nowhere. So you've landed. Time to pick an objective and work towards it. Plot your map and ping whatever is closest. This lets the rest of your team know what you're planning on doing without having to type it out or use voice chat. Alternatively, you can follow someone else. Going in duos is the most effective way of clearing higher difficulties, assuming the situation allows for it, and it usually does. If you're not feeling confident, sticking to a full squad is fine, just you might not clear the whole map in time. Spot objectives are good to knock out early if they're close by. You can usually spot one out in the distance rather easily once you've played for a while. Everything can be done solo, but it's always better to have a buddy around who can cover you, at least for the bigger side objectives. Triggering a side objective or a main sub-objective will usually cause a patrol to spawn near you, which will head towards your location. You'll want to either work fast or take it out as soon as possible. That's not to mention the enemies that will most likely be guarding the objective itself. If you're too slow to stop a flare, you might be in for a big fight. For something minor like an illegal broadcast or a tiny outpost that you can kill in a single airstrike, you'll be fine going solo just remember to ping whatever place you're going to. The geological survey is unique in that it forces a reinforcement wave when it started. So objectives are manageable in duos, but the main survey will require the whole team, so be prepared for that. If you're moving about in a duo, it might be tricky knowing when to call on a supply. You should try to sustain yourself on the randomly generated supplies around the map, but if you can't, it's better to ask if the other duo does need the supplies more. Guys, do you need supplies? If you need it, you can grab them, man. We're good. Similarly, don't double dip without asking first. That should come to you automatically, but unless you can obviously tell that nobody else needs that supply pack, ask. When it comes to reinforcing, try to be considerate. If someone from the other duo dies, don't call in the reinforcement yourself, unless the other guy dies too as well. If you must reinforce, do make sure that you're not throwing the ball into the crowd of enemies. If it's for an intended strategy, like dropping onto heavy enemies to kill them with your pod, then sure, throw the ball into the crowd. Uh, but other than that, try to throw the reinforced beacon somewhere in a safe place. Nobody likes dying as soon as they respawn. While we're on the traveling part, some quick notes about what you might see. Friendship vaults are almost always good to get, but require two people. Ping it, say it in text chat or voice chat, or use the voice wheel and get someone to help. Who knows what might be inside? Another thing to look out for is a super sample rock. It looks like a chicken drumstick with some glowy veins, or uh, something a bit more phallic that I can't show. This is the home of the super samples, and the only place where they spawn. You might have two or more of these rocks per mission, so don't be discouraged if you only find supplies there. The samples are just somewhere else. And of course, you have to be at the minimum difficulty of 7 to find them. Now, the big one. Patrols, outposts and fighting. It might be a shooter game, but don't feel the need to fight every single patrol. If you see a patrol in the distance or on the radar, point it out to your team and try to avoid it. 
unless it's made up of a bunch of weak enemies and all your squad mates can take it down instantly, don't engage. Getting into a cascading reinforcement battle in the middle of nowhere is wasteful. Crouch down and go around. You don't need to be stealthing the whole mission, but occasionally, and especially on hell dive, sneaking is necessary. Sprinting massively increases your visibility, so keep that in mind. This is a very crucial behavior that can make or break your run. If you start fighting for no reason and start dying over and over, you're gonna lose a mission. You don't get a reward for kills, only for doing objectives. And besides that, there's gonna be a lot of shooting to do later. There's no such thing as a stealth mission in Helldivers, just try to keep your load in your pants during these moments. Don't go into a last stand every 5 minutes, you'll just lose the mission from attrition and time. Patrols and their spawn rate are affected by heat zones and some other things. Uh, this reddit post goes into more detail. Essentially, there's a global timer for a patrol to spawn. Bigger outposts radiate heat and spawn more patrols. Destroying them lowers the global patrol timer, but makes the immediate area have less patrols. Basically, it's still worth destroying outposts. I'll leave the link in the description if you want to read for yourself. As for the fights themselves, that's something that you'll get better at automatically as time goes on. Against the automatons, it's important to play it like a cover shooter. Hide behind side cover or dive into craters. Against the bugs, you'll almost always be running around. In both cases, you need to stay aware of your surroundings. Don't stand next to explosive barrels. Don't run into a friendly airstrike and don't throw your own strikes next to your teammates. If there's a heavy enemy around, ping it, immediately. Don't assume that your squad mates are keeping track of everything around them, sometimes enemies can really sync up on you. Awareness might be the key to success, uh, but the lock itself is sometimes rusty and has a weird stickiness to it. And of course, cover your teammates. You should be sticking decently close together anyway, so if you see a buddy running away from a horde, cover him. If he's out of stims or ammo, stim him up or resupply him. You can do that by looking at your HUD or just looking at their backpack if they have a support weapon. If you have the supply pack, help them out. If a teammate died and dropped their weapon, ping it out to them. And if you come across some extra supplies, ping those too. Sharing is caring. If you have a good, solid, synchronized team, you should be making it out of every fight without too many deaths. Now, what you really have to worry about is the main objective. Once you complete it, the amount of patrols quadruples. You really, really want to do all the side objectives first because there will be no time to do them after. Even when you're running the mission perfectly, the timer might still get a bit tight. Once again I want to emphasize the importance of being mobile and not getting bogged down. This is why light armor tends to be used so much. A quick and aggressive playstyle can make a good use out of that extra stamina. So let's assume you've had a good mission and it's time to extract. If you're sitting at the main objective, you're gonna have a bunch of patrols heading your way. Don't sit there and try to reenact D-Day, for the love of god. Crouch and try to stealth your way out. If that's not possible, make a fighting retreat. As long as you're moving away, you should end up doing fine. Whoever gets to extract first should hit it as soon as they can. I know the host likes to have control, but really the first man arriving should just start up the extract, unless the situation doesn't call for it for some reason. This is especially important to do if you're under a longer calling modifier and the pelican will take even longer to arrive. You should also have your extract prepared with extra supplies and excess equipment as I recommended earlier. Triggering an extract doesn't cause a reinforcement wave, but the extract zone itself is also a heat generator, much like an outpost. Patrols will spawn around and head in your direction. You'll have to eliminate them quickly, or you'll be in for a fight. If you're unlucky and happen to be outside of the extract when it gets triggered while the rest of the team is already there, do not drag a conga line of enemies to the extract. You should be trying to sneak towards the extract, but if you're in a fight, either evade it or fight it. I realize that this might not always be possible, and it doesn't get me upset personally, but you probably already know how hectic extracts tend to get. Those four bile titans on your ass are the last thing that's needed. In the end, if it all goes smoothly, all you have to do is wait. And uh, remember to pick up those samples that you might have dropped. Get to the end screen and jump into the next mission. It might be a lot to take in, but getting good at things with time and effort isn't super advanced science. Just keep at it and you'll get better eventually. And lastly, random tips I couldn't fit anywhere else. Stratagem sticking aka charger bullying 101. You take out your EAT call-in or any other weapon slash blue stratagem, aim it at the top of their head and toss. If you do it correctly, it will stick and kill them outright, even if they're at full health. You can do this to other enemies too, but it's not quite as easy. Hulks, cannon towers, tanks and chargers are vulnerable from behind to explosives and medium AP weapons, which you probably know already. If you're feeling ballsy, you can run around them and throw impact grenades at their backs. Hulks will usually turn around too quickly for this, so you might want to enlist the help of a squad mate. Ping the Hulk, get it to chase you, 
and hope your squad has a good aim. Okay, I think that about covers my schizophrenic rambling. I hope that there were at least one or two pieces of information that you found useful. If you feel more confident about running the higher difficulties, then I consider my work to be a success. Just remember you're not going to be an ultra giga chat right off the bat. It's alright to fail. I still have my occasional loss. And most importantly, don't stick rigidly to the best stuff. Try to have fun. I hopefully set you on your own path towards getting better at the game. Once you feel confident, you should branch out into whatever place how you feel like is the most fun. I will now do the meme and ask you to subscribe or like the video if you enjoyed it. Probably not in that order, but whatever. Yes, it's a joke, but it does actually help. If this video comes out when I think it will, the next Warband will be released like 12 hours later, but I probably won't be covering it immediately. There's some other stuff that I want to do. Still, Helldivers is a fun game, and it will probably stay around for a while, so I'll definitely be making more videos on it at some point in the future. There have been some minor things that I didn't mention in this video, because it would make it even longer, and I feel like half an hour is already pretty long. Trust me, it was even longer before I started cutting things down. So maybe a follow-up will be next at some point. Until then, thanks for watching, and bye for now.